Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome to Live in London, the special show on this special Sunday evening. Recently, we had a member of parliament make controversial comments in regards to the Muslim dress code, the burqa, the niqab. He referred to Muslim women as looking like letterboxes, burglars. This obviously provoked a, a very, very angry response from Muslims and non Muslims alike. But what is the historical and the, the fiqh, the ahkam rulings in regards to the niqab? As Muslims, are we supposed to cover our faces or is this just mustahab or is it just cultural? Furthermore, we have the likes of France and Denmark having campaigns to ban the burqa. Where does, where does this lead to and how can we as Muslims react and respond to such situations? Surely we also have the freedom to dress how we want to. Isn't that a right of every human being? Inshallah, we'll discuss this and a lot more with Dr. Said Amar Akshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Doctor. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Doctor, very controversial, very, very, you know, uh, you know in, in trend right now. But are we as Muslims the only religion that actually cover ourselves and, and cover our faces? Well, I think what was uh, disappointing about the statements that were made, and I know that we have so many viewers who are uh, from outside of the UK who may be asking, well, what exactly has taken place? And you've got, you know, a person who was in a political position in this country, respected political position as, you know, mayor of London or in a foreign secretary position, who described a certain spectrum of Muslim women who have the face veil on as uh, similar to letterboxes and even similar to burglars. And what was disappointing about such statements is that he was the mayor of what is arguably the most cosmopolitan city in the world. There is no city, and I'm proud to say this, as a Londoner, and I'm proud of having been raised in London, um, and for me there is no place on this earth like London. Uh, I'm proud to say that you, know, you could look around you and you could see people of different faiths, people of different backgrounds, uh, denominations who are able to live together in peace and harmony you know on one street you may be having uh, a neighbor who may be of the Sikh community or you may be having a neighbor of the Jewish community and you're absolutely right when you state that they also have forms of uh, head covering if you look, for example, within the Sikh religion, the turban or the dastar that they wear, you'll find that many will wear it until today, in some cases with a view of it being obligatory, in other cases with a view of it being recommended. But the basis of it is a form of honor, a form of reverence, a form of respect and dignity for that person. Some would also say a form of identity. No? Identity as well, as in... I felt sorry for some members of the Sikh community in the aftermath of 9-11 when they got attacked because people thought they were Muslims. Yeah. You know. And then you've got members of the Jewish community in London who will wear the kippah. And when they're wearing it again, you'll find that some of the Orthodox Jewish uh, community members will wear it on the basis of it being obligatory. Then there'll be others who may say, well, it's not obligatory, but it should be encouraged with the children from a very young age. In other words, Islam is not unique in the fact that it talks about a head covering with an understanding of honor and dignity and respect and reverence surrounding it. And we've lived in London for so long where interfaith has been part and parcel of the success of many of these religious communities. You go to virtually every council in the London boroughs, and you'll, say that you'll see that there is an interfaith group where members of these religions come together and they're able to benefit and learn from one another. Like I'm speaking next week um, at an interfaith event on the concept of sacrifice in Islam and Christianity with a priest of the uh, Christian community. And there is that love and that respect that is there. So it was very disappointing when this was said because it then antagonizes. Who does it antagonize? Firstly, it may antagonize members of the Muslim community. Secondly, even members of the non-Muslim community who are disturbed when a person dictates, well, this is the exact way that you have to dress. Then there are certain with maybe extreme opinions 
about how this country does not give rights to Muslims, who will use that to then further explore angles of even terrorizing in this country. As in when someone comes and says, why is it that some of these bomb blasts have happened? If you're going to have comments like this, you're feeding that type of person, antagonizing that type of person, who's now making an excuse to say, well, if he's going to take the mick out of my mother's, for example, face veil. And we know that the face veil is not something which is seen in the majority of the members of the Muslim community. But it exists. Likewise, the kippah is not going to be seen on every member of the Jewish community, for example, in London. But it exists. Likewise, there are many Sikh who do not wear the turban. But still, it exists. When I'm now going to make fun of it and say letterbox or burglars, I'm feeding, and I'm also feeding another group, the racist establishment. Because we could see around the world at the moment there's a, a sort of racism that's creeping in. A racism where it's very normal to mock, not just religion, but to mock the beliefs of a group of a particular religion. And now, for certain people in especially white supremacist groups, uh, whether it's here or whether it's other countries, well, they're going to say, well, if a top official can make such comments, what's there to stop us taking our, our venom on these people? And that's why you find that there are reports that certain ladies who've decided in their life to wear the face veil were the victims of hate attacks. Not many, but it doesn't have to be many. It could be one acid attack could destroy the whole fabric of a community. Likewise, it could be one push towards the middle of the road can kill someone's life. So we have to look at this and try and come together to explain the background of this because I think also many Muslims are uncertain. Face veil, obligatory, not obligatory, is the veil Obligatory, not obligatory, yeah. In regards to the veil being obligatory or not obligatory, I mean, what does the Quran have to say in regards to that? I mean, surely it, it mentions about the hijab and covering of the hair. Is it that to that extent, does it not go on further to discuss anything about covering the face at all? I don't, think, I don't think the Quran... I don't think the Quran uses the word hijab in relation to covering the hair. Therefore, on YouTube, if you find certain people who are saying that there is no verse in the Qur'an which tells you wear a hijab on your head, I think they're right. There is no verse in the Qur'an that says, get a hijab and put it on your head. But then we have to look at the evolution of the word hijab. Words evolve. The coinage of terms is a study within itself. If you look in Usul al-Fiqh, there is a chapter in Usul al-Fiqh where they discuss the evolution of a particular term. How did this term originate linguistically and how did it evolve into the legal definition? We call the discussion the discussion of a term that is ta'yini or ta'ayuni. You may have a word like salah. Salah in its origin means dua. Later on, salah became associated with praying five times a day. Yeah. You may have a word like faqih. Faqih in the origin of the word, someone who is deep and well versed in religion. The evolution of the term has undergone a number of steps, one of them being, for example, jurist. Today when you say faqih, you're referring to jurist. <laughs> Originally, tafaqqaf al din didn't only say go and learn law, but there's been an evolution in the term. So in Usul al-Fiqh, when one is looking at wadh and the discussion of ta'yini and ta'ayuni, there are terms that evolve. Even the word faqih, how is it looked at by Ahlul Bayt? How do they define who a faqih is? How important is the title of faqih 
to one of their companions, to our understanding of a tradition. Likewise, with the word hijab, the word hijab, the coinage of the term has undergone an evolution. If you're asking me, where in the Quran does it say that there should be a veil on the head of a woman, then when you're looking for hijab, you're looking for the wrong word. The word hijab is what we use today for that. In Arabia, the head covering was known as the khimar. You notice with alcohol being an intoxicant, it's called khamur. Yeah. But why is it called khamur? Because it's that which covers one's reasoning. Likewise, the khimar was seen as a cover that Arabian women used to already wear. That word khimar is the word that you have to look for if you're trying to find out what is head covering in the Quran. And in Surah 24 verse 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an order to the Muslim woman with the word khimar. وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرُهِنَّ عَلَىٰ جِيُوبِهِنَّ Let them now draw their veils over their chest area, over their bosom area. These Arabian women used to already cover their heads, but their neck and chest area was showing. When the Quran said, What was the Quran telling us? The Quran was telling us now tell these women to draw their veils that they already have on over their chest area. Therefore, when a person's looking for the head covering in the Quran, if I go on YouTube today, I'll find that there are many videos on YouTube today which say there is nothing mentioning hijab in the Quran. Hijab, the only thing that's mentioned about it is that it's a barrier that exists, say, between a man and a woman. Well, I'm not looking for the word hijab. The word hijab is what linguistically later on may take a legal connotation in certain traditions. But if I'm looking for the word khimar, that's when I find the word for head covering in the Quran. Because today I receive many emails of people saying, if it's not in the Quran, why should I wear? And then we see, for example, the actions of the Ahlul Bayt and the explanations of the Ahlul Bayt. Have the Ahlul Bayt said that there is no head covering in the Quran? Then why should we cover our heads? But when we look at the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, who are the walking Quran, who are the Thaqalain alongside the Quran, then we find that they tell us that now that veil that you're wearing, you draw it over this bosom area. Yeah. We'd like to remind all our viewers that this is a uh, live show that you can call in with your questions on 0203 515 0199 or if you alternatively you could uh, whatsapp it to us on the lower third the number should be there you can whatsapp your question inshallah the Sayyid will be able to discuss that with you say that you were discussing the, the Quranic ayah saying to the ladies to you know cover their chest and bosom. me personally I've got females in my family I've got sisters and cousins and stuff and unfortunately some of them don't wear hijab I mean what is the best method to go and to discuss do they have every right not to wear the hijab? Is it something that should be taught to them and they make their own choice? Or is it something that is compulsory upon all Muslim women to wear? Well, there's no doubt that it's obligatory, whether you're looking at you know, Shia, Sunni schools and their legal systems, there's no doubt that it's obligatory. Uh, but maybe sometimes how it's explained to them has a bearing. Sometimes you have people who are able to explain it properly. There are others, if you tell them Surah 24 verse 31, they don't know the ayah. There are others who may have their own interpretation or go to, you know, they'll say, well, in my opinion, there is no ayah, so why should I be wearing hijab? Then there are others, the, the pressure of their society sometimes gets to them, where you find that in some cases they'll say, well, me in hijab, you know, and when we're talking hijab now, we're saying what we use as the term today, that, that mixture of physical and social modesty, not just physical, because you know it comes as a combination. The manners and etiquettes are just as important as the clothing ones wear in the life of any human being for that matter. I think that you'll find some who may turn around and say, well, I think I look better 
uh, without covering my, my head. And, you know, it, it's a major sacrifice, there's no doubt. If a person was to look at Abraham's story with his son when he sacrifices him, look at the subliminal rather than the literal message. And the subliminal message is that each of us have a sacrifice in our life. There is absolutely no doubt that everyone wants to show the finer parts of their body and everyone wants to wear that which shows the finer parts and everyone also wants to reveal their hair and the colors of their hair and the styles of their hair and so on. And so when we sit here as men discussing this issue, it's easy for us to sit down and say, well, you know what, you have to wear because the Quran is saying you have to wear and so on. But we also appreciate that there are some who may be down in terms of, um, you know, in terms of their feelings that they feel, well, if I wear it, then I may not get married. Guys are not mm -hmm. attracted to me because I'm not wearing it. And some guys don't help as well. Because I believe that the whole hijab issue, the whole veil issue, men are as much involved in the success of it as women. When you have certain Muslim men who are like, well, I don't want to marry a girl that covers. That is quite an arrogant statement to make. Um, and that also is condescending in a way to some of our sisters as well uh, that do wear. And to those who don't wear, when you're telling them that, you know what, I don't want you to wear. Which in reality means that I really don't care what the Ahlul Bayt have said. It's my life and I decide, you know, what you do and what you don't. And I think at that stage, some give in to that pressure. Then there are others who may turn around and say to you that, listen, you live in a country which is cosmopolitan like London. Whereas I may be living in a certain part of the world where I'm stared at because I wear that hijab. And it is true. There are certain sisters of ours who go and study in certain places in the world where until today there may be people who are not used to the hijab. Doesn't mean that they're going to be racist, but they're just not used to it. And it's extremely difficult at that beginning. Then there are people out there who may not wear the hijab, but don't write them off. Because at the end of the day, any second they may decide that, you know what, I want to wear the veil. Um, I think this is the time for me to wear the veil. I do wish that we were told when we were going to die so that we could at least, you know, if I know I'm going to die at 50, then I can at least mess about for 49 years and then, you know, be religious in my last year. But I think when I don't know, I think that's the only thing that one has to bear in mind that any second you could return back to your Lord why with everything that your Lord has given you, why would there be this one area in particular which you don't want to give in to? And then that is one's personal relationship with their Lord. But if we're looking at the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, then physical hijab is as much and as important as the social hijab as well. Yeah. Excellent. Sayyidina, what about you know, the freedom of expression and, and you know, the, the different types of fashion that people would like to adopt which is perfectly acceptable and halal in Islam so you know sometimes they will be you know loose clothing and then sometimes the different styles that they can wear the headscarf I remember at university there was all there was big commotion in regards to the turban hijab uh, the camo hump hijab and, and, and so many and so forth you can see online and there's even tutorials on YouTube now on how to do these different types of hijab I mean is there room for this in Islam yeah I think there's room for this I think there is room for this um, I believe that the generation that had to grow up in the West have worked their socks off to try and maintain their identity. They have to juggle a number of identities. In some cases, for example, you may juggle being British, Iraqi, Muslim, Shia, number of identities you're juggling. And I think in many cases, it's not that they want to give in their modesty. But they want to show that, you know what, I could be respected as well. This garment that I'm wearing shouldn't make you think that I am wearing it because I'm uneducated or I'm illiterate. No, I know the principles of my religion. I know what I believe in. Um, and this that I'm wearing actually is part of my growth and part of my empowerment. And alhamdulillah, we have sisters out there who the struggles they've gone through and how they have overcome them and the work they've done as doctors, as dentists, as lawyers, as people in finance and engineering and media and so on. Phenomenal work. So there are many men out there who always want to pick on things that, well, look at her, she's got a colorful hijab or look at her, 
she has. And you know what, Habib, you have to look at yourself. You know, sometimes you may be someone who has certain jurisprudential things you're not necessarily living up to in terms of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. If it's someone in your household, there's always a reminder. You can always remind each other. And I think Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi al Munkar does have a place. But, you know, if your house is made out of stone, then uh, your house is made out of glass, then don't throw stones at mm -hmm. uh, everybody out there. Yeah. Excellent. Sayyidina, what about, you know, um, the, the practicalities of wearing it? Some of our sisters want to go to the gym. Uh, some take jogs in the morning. Surely wearing the hijab and, and then the cover is just it's impractical. Especially living in London, especially in the summertime with all the heat. Well, I think what then begins to happen is in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to show us that an outer covering, an extension of what you're wearing, is something which is obligatory. Now, I don't care if that outer covering is, you know, Nike or Dolce & Gabbana or, you know, there's different outer coverings now because they're now even doing abayas and they're doing sportswears, all these big designers and fashion houses and so on. And I think there's nothing wrong because the Quran mentions that wearing the head covering and your basic clothing to protect your modesty, there needs to be an outer layer. If you look in Surah 33 verse 59 of the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِي قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ وَنِسَاءَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُدْنِينَ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ جَلَابِي بِهِنْ the Quran says, and orders the Prophet, tell your uh, wives, your daughters, and the believing woman to wear an outer garment. That outer garment was to preserve their modesty, ensure that they're not hurt by others out there. You know, when we, you look at that Me Too campaign that took place, Many Muslims remained quiet at that time when Me Too happened. And it's as if there were many Muslims who were like, mm, I told you so. You, know, you kept on telling us we look like we're wearing too many layers. And you used to take the mick out of you know, our woman by saying that their women are oppressed and shackled. How many in Hollywood came out and said, he touched me, he groped me, he pinched me, he ordered me to do this and that. It was disgusting what happened to these ladies. But maybe that's why Islam was saying that the outer garment may be a form of protection. Now don't get me wrong, we have Muslim men who are as bad, if not worse, than some of these people who had uh, indecently assaulted and disrespected the woman in, in, in Hollywood and other, other areas. You know, there are so many women who can't speak out because these women, in many cases, they have families to look after, households to look after. And so when they're groped at work, even this, this, the very person who had made the comment about, you know, these women with the face veil, um, looking like letterboxes, was known to have even made comments in the past about, you know, pat a woman on her, you know, on her backside and tell her to move on when you want something done and so on. Now, that type of comment is why Islam was saying that, listen, you want to go to the gym, you want to go for a jog, you know what, these are not haram things, more than welcome, but try and wear something which is a bit more loose fitting in the hope that this would build a society with a bit more modesty. Fantastic. Sayyidina, what about uh, in terms of the makeup and in terms of, uh, you know, um, the face covering? Um, you know, surely, you know, some women are away, wake up and others refuse to and wear the face covering. And does Islam actually tell us that we have to wear the face covering? Does it tell us that this is mandatory? And I mean, I mean, did, did that person actually have a right to actually go and have an attack on this piece of clothing? It's an interesting question because when you're looking at that same ayah, Surah 24, verse 31, there is a part of that ayah. If you look at the beginning, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَضْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ Tell the believing woman to lower their gaze and to uh, protect their privacy. وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا 
and to not reveal that which adorns them, except that which is apparent. Now someone says, what does it mean? What does that mean? The idea was that, for example, I'm a Muslim, if I'm a Muslim woman living at a time, and I've got, for example, you know, all my finest jewelry and necklaces and everything that is an adornment for me, that is now to be covered in this new concept of modesty, except for what? Except for my face and my hands. That is what can be showing. That was seen as the majority opinion of many scholars. That they say that a Muslim woman can show their face and can show their hands, for example. Some may have extended it even to the feet. And they base this on traditions, for example, in the Shia school, based on traditions in two ways. Either you go to Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq, which is where we get most of our traditions, where when they asked what is the definition or the tafsir or the meaning of وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا they reply by saying that you cover the adornments except your face and your hands. And that's why you'll find the majority of Muslim women who, for example, may be uh, covered, their face is showing and their hands are showing. And you'll find that, for example, scholars like Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah bless him and give him a long life, you'll find that he will say uh, that the face can be showing and that the hands can be showing. However, if you are showing the face and the hands, then do, for example, do not use the face and the hands um, in a way in which you're going to be attracting um, those with lustful intentions. Now that brings about the discussion. So for example, if you're saying that إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا is referring to being allowed to show the face and the hands, someone asks, okay, can a woman put makeup on? And I think many times with Muslims, you'll have this many who look for black and white. So there'll be some who'll say no makeup at all. And there'll be others who'll say, no, I want to wear makeup completely on my face. And I think there's a balance like everything. There should be a balance even on this area. That you'll find the maraja, I'm not going to say to you, you cannot wear makeup at all. There may be certain people, we have to admit this, that there may be certain people may have skin defects, for example, or skin issues. They may Some have spots, acne, and so on. And they may want to cover that. And, and also, some may put subtle makeup on. You know, no one's, no one's saying that you put, like, you know, a particular type of lipstick, which, you know, is bringing that attraction. But there may be something more subtle than that. And then... There are those out there who, for example, will say, well, if Ayatollah Sistani allows us to show our face, our hands, then I'm going to put nail polish, for example. And once again, Ayatollah Sistani puts the condition in his discussion that the Quran has said, yes, you cover your head, but your face can be shown, your hands can be shown. But if what you put onto your hands or onto your face is going to bring about that wrong, um, immoral, you know, actions, um, from yourself and from the men. And I have to stress on the men because when the ayah says, before that it said, tell the believing men to lower their gaze. So for as much as we're discussing that, okay, there is a veil and whether there is a face veil, there's no face veil, there is a, a major stipulation for, for men to be the ones who are part of the growth of this moral society as well. Um, and today people say, well, you know, so I can't put nail polish on. Well, why are you putting the nail polish on? Uh, you're obviously putting nail polish on because you think that that nail polish is something which, which looks good. Um, and someone will say, yeah, but you know, that's all. I, I don't want to attract anybody else out there with it. But then it may in the greater picture, um, there may be others who will use these to bring about, you know, uh, attraction and so on. And that could lead to immoral acts, for example. So. So when, when you've got this, some will say, okay, well, now there's nail polish. And they'll say, okay, how about nail polish where I want to wear it and it's not got really a color because now there's a nail polish color called nude. Uh, don't ask me how I know these things, but, you know, sometimes <laughs> you research these things and you come up with, with interesting facts. But they ask about wudu. And then someone will say, well, I went to a store. And it's very interesting. They ask me, can you wear, uh, you know, nail polish if the water 
uh, what do they say? The, uh, well, the water will... Uh, well, well, permeable, I mean, it permeable. can go through. Yeah. Can go through yeah. Well, I'm not a marja and nail polish, and I don't think, you know, Ayatollah Sistani is, has got a chapter on, on nail polish, but if you ask the experts in there, they'll tell you whether this actually is something which you can do with or in or no. There are, you know, Muslim sisters who work in these areas who will be able to tell you the reality of these things, for example. Yeah. What about uh, saying what about henna? Because henna is really recommended, and and uh, you know a lot, a lot of our sisters wear. Even the well, I, I men think, wear it. I think, like like I said, you know, there are certain things which are recommended by a time and a place. If you're going to wear henna amongst the ladies of the community, there's no harm whatsoever. You're going to wear makeup amongst the ladies of the community. You're going to a wedding, wear as much makeup as you want, but try and make sure that when the Quran has said the stipulation that you can show your face, the Quran is saying also at the, the hadiths and the you know the scholarly opinion are saying to us that. Maintain it within um, the world of modesty. Now, when we come to that opinion, therefore, you'll find Ayatollah Sistani, uh, you know, uh, the great uh, scholars, many of them would have said that you're allowed to show your face and hands. But there are a couple of scholars who said no. Uh, amongst them, Ayatollah al khui Ayatollah al khui may Allah bless his soul, uh, the greatest of you know, jurists and teacher of so many renowned jurists today, who have, yeah. who have, you know, who are alive or have passed away. Um, he cites, for example, certain traditions, which he then builds an opinion that no, the woman should be wearing, for example, um, a face veil. There is a particular tradition that he cites uh, where one of the companions of the imams asks them about seeking uh, the witnessing of a woman for a particular court case. This can be found in, uh, in Kitab al-Istabsar of Shaykh al-Tusi. And Sayyid al-Khu'i uh, looks at this discussion because the Imam actually tells the person that she should be covering her face to a certain extent because they want to verify how can we verify that it is her before she witnesses. And this is a difficult, sensitive moment and the Imam uh, says that she should be uh, covering uh, a majority of her face. You could, for example, see uh, the eyes, and that's about it. And that's only because she's got to testify or he's got to testify in court. Otherwise, someone like Ayatollah al khui is of the belief that the, the Muslim woman should be one who covers her face. Now what's interesting is that sometimes when you look at Jilbab, which we mentioned earlier, Yudnina alayhina min jalabi bihin, or you look at Chador, or you're looking at these things, when the ladies in Iran or in Iraq, in some cases will speak to you, they'll go like that. So they're not walking in the street necessarily going like that, but when someone is coming to them, who they may not know, they will, for example, cover their face. So you're not actually wearing a niqab, but the way they put the Abaya, or the way they put the chador, or the way they put the, uh, you know, the mantu, or, you know, cov covering that comes with the abaya, they put it in a way in which they're trying to cover their modesty with loose-fitting clothing and so on. So, one may argue that today, and the application of that could be that rather than just having a face veil directly, the application may be that a, you know someone might be wearing a looser garment and covering their face from the foreigner. Because Ayatollah Khu'i talks about the person, there's someone who's muhtaram, you know, there may, it may be a bit, um, that person's a decent person, someone closer to you. And interestingly, if you're looking at Al-Kafi or Man La Yahdaruh Al-Faqih or Ala uh, Al-Shara' of Saduq, so two books of Shaykh Al-Saduq and one book of Shaykh Al-Kulayni, they all give narrations about Fatima Al-Zahra alayhi salam showing her face. Now then there's this major debate that takes place. What's wow. the reliability of the tradition? Ayatollah Khu'i discusses the reliability. Ayatollah Sistani amongst others. Uh, you know, the author of the Jawahar and others who, who, who are looking at, is it true that Fatima Zahra showed her face? Did Fatima Zahra show her face just to anyone? Was it just to Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari or just to Salman al-Farsi al al-Muhammadi? Mutahari also discussed this. So you've got all these people who discuss this, that you know, the face veil, if Fatima al-Zahra salam's face was seen, that means that that face veil is not obligatory. Um, whereas Ayatollah al-Khu'i will say, but if the Imam is talking about 
the niqab being worn for this woman who's got to testify in this court case or who they have to testify on behalf of, why would the Ahlul Bayt tell her to, you know, be in that state unless they're giving us the indication that the woman, the majority of her face should not be able to be seen. This area above the nasal and below the uh, forehead. So it's interesting how they go back and forth in their discussion of this area. Yeah. Sayyidina, you mentioned Sayyid Khoy and you mentioned Shia you know, sources uh, in regards to the niqab. What about other schools of thought in Islam? Do they have any, um, you know, ruling in regards to this? Do they say it's wajib or mustahab to cover the face? It's interesting because if you're looking, for example, at, at this, a state like Saudi Arabia, for example, and for a long time in Saudi Arabia, you had this, you know, these laws, especially if you're going to Mecca and Medina, majority of the women that you see are all um, wearing a niqab. And always I used to find it interesting when I'd sit in a, in a Burger King in, in Mecca, for example, um, and you know, you're, you're smashing that whopper, absolutely destroying it. And, and you've got this lady who constantly has to go like this, you know, she takes the, the niqab off and she has a bite and then she puts it back. And I think you'll see this in, in Dubai, you'll see this in other parts of the world. Um, and I'm not making fun of that lady because it's, it takes a lot of iman, a lot of, you know, faith, a lot of respect and modesty for her to continuously. But you'll find that in Saudi Arabia, for example, the scholars of the Salafi school, I'd say probably the three of the most famous scholars of the Salafi school, contemporary, um, Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen, and um, Al-Albani. Um, you'll find that a couple of them have said that it's obligatory. And the other, for example, has pointed to the fact that it's mustahab rather than uh, wajib. Uh, and it's interesting when you're looking at the discussions, there's that famous hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, I think Sa'ab ibn Abi Waqqas narrates it, where Umar ibn al-Khattab walks in, where there's these women chatting to the Prophet, and they've raised their voices against the Prophet. And then when Umar walks in, they all of a sudden, you know, are scared. And he's like, well, you're scared of me walking in, and all of us, and but with the Prophet, you're not. And they're like, well, Umar, you're fearful and you're fierce. And the, the Prophet famously, peace be upon his family, says, uh, uh, by the one who's, uh, in whose uh, hand my soul is. Um, when shaitan sees you going on one path, he goes on another path. Um, so when shaitan would see Umar ibn al-Khattab, because of how faithful um, and frightening Umar ibn al-Khattab was, shaitan would always look to take another path. Uh, but what's interesting is that these women recognize Omar's coming, they're sitting with the Prophet, and their faces are seemingly showing. Then you have a more interesting incident, I think Ibn Ma generates, where there used to be this beautiful lady who used to pray behind the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. She used to pray in Jama'ah, but she, when she used to come and pray, everybody would be like, you know, I want to go Jama'ah. And um, when they'd all want to go to Jama'ah, um, the narrations would mention that they'd go because in Rukur, they want to look at her as they're going on their way down. Now, if she was wearing a face veil, they're not all going to turn up and try and look at her. Yeah. So we're going to go to a break now, Sayyid that. So, uh, inshallah, we'll continue the discussion and you can give us your questions, inshallah, in, after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Live in London where we're discussing the burqa and the niqab. Our phone lines are open, so if you have a question you'd like to direct to the Sayyid, call us on 0203 515 or alternatively you can get us on the WhatsApp, the number should be on the lower third there. Sayyidina, you were discussing uh, the Prophet leading Jama'ah and, and you know there, there was uh, a lot of people coming to Jama'ah. There was a specific reason that they were coming. Could you please continue? Yeah, these... Uh 
quite sexually frustrated Arabs in some cases, you know, they, <laughs> or I think it's just the climate sometimes that gets to them, um, or maybe the richness of some of the food, but there was this beautiful girl who would come and pray in the jama'ah. So you've got, for example, the Prophet praying and you've got um, rows of, uh, of the jama'ah. And then, of course, ladies can be behind. And, and what you have is that when this lady would be there, uh, these companions would, uh, would come. And why would they come? Because in Rukur, they want to look through. As they're going down in Rukur, they want to look through their armpits to see her face. Is that even possible? I mean, yeah. well, I, I don't know. You know, the, the the Arab could do absolutely anything sometimes, and and these guys would would be there. And some say that the ayah in the Quran, Surah 15, verse 24, was revealed about them. وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْنَا الْمُسْتَقْرِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْنَا الْمُسْتَقْدِمِينَ الْمُسْتَقْدِمِينَ of course refers to those. There was some who came before and some who came after. So when the Quran said, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْنَا الْمُسْتَقْدَمِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْنَا الْمُسْتَأْخِرِينَ It was saying that there are some of you who come early and then there are others of you who come late. What's the intention? The intention is to try and come and see who exactly that lady was. Now if that lady had covered her face, then there is no way that they'll be looking forward to seeing her. But it's only because her face was showing. And so some of the scholars say the fact that that lady's face was showing means that niqab was not obligatory. So when the Quran is talking about the mustaqdameen and the mustakhireen, it's saying that uh, these groups were coming there for that reason that her face was showing. Yeah. Senna, you mentioned in Saudi Arabia and, and this is what you saw. I mean, we have those countries out there that are implementing Islamic Sharia and Islamic law. Does a country have a right to actually, you know, force the hijab as as, an, as a law of the of the land, as, as state law? And what about those who are not Muslim and is, and they don't want to wear the hijab or, or cover their head? And it's debatable, you know. And I think if if any country will try and make sure that their laws look after the honor and the growth of the intellect, um, as well as the protection of people's property and religion. And if that country believes that part of protection of the honor of the people is to ensure that modesty is safeguarded, and that part of modesty being safeguarded is that the veil is to be worn, then that's, you know, that is up to the country at the end of the day and, and the laws that they institute. Um, and there are so people differ some say this is needed because they'll say, listen, if you allow a society where you tell all the men, listen, lower your gaze, lower your gaze, lower your gaze. But every time the man turns somewhere, you know, there isn't much modesty, then this could lead to immorality. So why not, for example, um, institute these laws? Others say no, that you can actually build society by building the conscience of the people um, in the sense that they become more conscious of the respect that's needed. Now, some people will say, well, you know what, typical male view, that males are the perverts, but they blame everything on the females. Okay, so there are certain societies in the world where the Me Too campaign spread. No one's forcing the veil in those societies. But this guy's, you know, touched this girl and this guy's done this to this girl and this guy's groped this girl and all for favors or all for extra so that they can go bigger in their banks or bigger in their films or they can catch you know have a role and believe you me if people will look at certain muslim majority countries and be like backward illiterate third world the moment that me too campaign began a lot of those people started to go a bit quiet because the idea was we live in a society where whatever makes everyone feel good is what should be practiced. Okay, so we let everyone feel good. And then we had um, these famous actresses who many of us have watched their films and admired and we did not know that she had to go through the following to get the role. So maybe those people who are saying to you, maybe that instituting the veil or modesty in certain Muslim countries is done to lessen the amount of occurrences of such behavior. 
Does that mean you completely stop it? Then other factors come in. Because then that goes towards the discussion of what type of punishments are entailed for the perverted male. Again, people might turn around and say, Islam, backward, archaic. What's this men are to be punished, are to be whipped, are to be flogged? A man who comes and gropes a, uh, another human being's daughter? Or a man who orders another human being's sister to sexually perform an act for him so that she lands a role or a job? That person has to be punished. There are some in certain countries who did that and they're still not punished because they're big names with big contacts and no one big can do name. anything to them. And their stories have all gone. So if someone today is saying to me that you know, there are certain Muslim countries and that these Muslim countries are countries which institute the veil and the institution of the veil is something that is oppressive, okay, then let's look at countries which never allowed for such institutions. And it's so sad when we hear the number of ladies who were so bright and worked so hard to reach where they are and the sexual acts that they had to perform as favors. It's very sad. Yeah. Sayyidina, let's bring it back to London and what happened with that uh, member of parliament. Did he have a right to actually criticize the, the veil? I mean, some people say covering the face makes, you know, makes it very intimidating. There's security issues. And furthermore, how as Muslims should we you know, uh, respond to criticism? I mean, did we respond in the right way? I don't have a problem with someone um, critiquing any of the teachings of the religion of Islam. I think many Muslims, the moment someone questions certain uh, beliefs or practices that they have, straight away they'll shout Islamophobia. I don't want to fall in the trap of those religions that always had that one word that you could always use if someone ever said something against you, just throw that word on people. I don't ever want to be, you know, someone who goes in that direction. I don't mind anyone writing a whole critique of Islam and even disproving the veil. But don't use terms like letterbox and burglars and things like that. Because that's insulting and that doesn't help bring the dignity of the society. Well, we even in the Muslim community, if we have someone in our community who, for example, is, is causing um, uh, antagonism and causing people to hate Islam. And we had certain personalities, if you remember, a few years ago where certain members of the Muslim community differed with the ways that they were talking, like Anjam Chowdhury and others. We also, in the Muslim community, many of us turned around and we said that this is not acceptable. The way this person is speaking about, about um, non-Muslims and so on. So critique, but with a bit of respect. Yeah. I believe we have a caller on the line. Hopefully this time it's going to be working. We have done all the tests. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Your name and where you're calling from? Uh, alaykum salam. I'm Dania from Yorkshire. Oh, lovely, lovely to have you. Your question please for the Sayyid. Thank you very much for your question. Saying that, why do women have to go to such lengths to cover up and, and not really much prescribed you know, for men? A hundred times more beautiful than we'll ever be. You know, that's the reality. Um, the male body and the female body, you know, male, males can never come near the beauty of the female. Um, you know, it's just a wonderful creation. And, and even when you're looking at, for example, you're looking at the Qur'an, the Qur'an first addressed the, the modesty of the men. And as I said earlier in the show, um, if men are not observing the hijab that is discussed for them, um, that is prescribed for them, then you can't expect the whole burden to be placed on the woman folk of the society. When the Quran said, you know, قُلِّ الْبُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارَهِمْ Tell the believing men to lower from their gaze. That is probably one of the hardest challenges that we have, but we have to observe it. It's a major sacrifice. You know, that one look, there are some who want to extend that look for the whole day. But you have to observe it. You have to also build morality within society. There are some who, for example, will say that even part of the male hijab is the beard. 
you know, and uh, there are many of us who may not want to have a beard. We may want to be clean shaven. Too many greys sometimes. Well, the greys are cool. There's nothing wrong <laughs> with the greys. But that is also. Also, there are, for example, certain um, in discussions concerning the aura of the male. And I think that there are many Muslims who may not be observing this. Uh, Muslim males who are always quick to point out that you know the female is not covered up properly when they are not covered up properly some on their on their Facebook or on their Twitter or on their you know profiles on the internet you'll find that they don't mind showing themselves not wearing much that is not hijab you know so there's also that hijab as well and I think the males if they looked at the things that they were doing wrong and working on um, I think that will help build that moral society. In many cases, sometimes when we're looking at the other gender, what we don't realize is much of the problems are coming because of us. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. So then we were talking about, um, you know, uh, the critique and criticizing, and we want, I wanted to ask you, how do us as Muslims respond to this? I mean, did we do it in the right way? Did it, with, with you know, because this, this uh, member of parliament, what you said, created a lot of Anger and, and, and a lot of you know, it sparked a, a sort of like a little revolution within Muslims and non Muslims alike. What are the best steps for us to go and attack, not attack, but how to handle the situation whenever we as Muslims are on the back foot? Well, I think um, it's vital for us to be more politically involved, vital for us to be more involved in the world of media as well. These two go hand in hand because in the world of media, you're able to, you know, publicly be able to respond to these things or write articles about them. Be proactive rather than reactive. So before he says anything like that, he could write an article in a major newspaper talking about the beliefs of, you know, or the laws of the religion. So there's more awareness. But politically at the same time, you know, I think it's important that we're there within the political scene. This country allows anyone to get to where he got, you know, a mayor of London before, and then the mayor of London after him is the Muslim side of Khan. So, you know, a person can get into those positions. I think it will help us in the future. So with your permission, if you go to some of the questions that I have from the, from the WhatsApp and from the Facebook. Um, it says from Belfast, there have been many cases recently that Muslims are declined from jobs because they refuse to shake hands with the interviewer because, uh, because of the, the interviewer is the opposite gender. Uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult for them because of their dress code and it doesn't really um, you know, work well with the uniform or, uh, of, of, the, of the workplace. How do we deal with such a situation when one is compelled to sacrifice their career for the sake of wearing hijab and niqab? It can be looked at from different angles. Either it may reach a stage where because of us making the governments of our, uh, you know, where we live, of our countries, aware of our practices, then the governments may institute that there are certain um, laws to be instituted which states that if it is a woman of a particular religion, or a member of a particular religion, and they say to you there's a religious reason for not shaking the hand, then it can be done. This is something that people may have to work towards. But I find a lot of the different um, institutions and companies in the Western world, I find a lot of them are very accommodating and understanding. If you look at graduation day in some universities, the dean is already oh, informed yeah. that, you know, if a girl comes wearing... Uh, the veil, then if, if you, you know, know that you don't shake hands, and you'll see many of them who may go like this, for example. We're not the only culture in the world whose woman may not shake the hand of someone who's not related to them, for example. There are other religions and other cultures who also believe in such things. We may be a religion that may have contradictions. So you may have a girl in hijab on graduation day who's coming up and she's like this and he's like that. Then you may have a, another girl who may be coming up and she's like that and he's thinking, well, is this a trick moment or a trick question? Do I, don't I? Um, so those contradictions sometimes also baffle people. Uh, but I think if it comes to the crunch and they're saying to you, we will not offer you a job because of you wearing that headscarf, then don't think about the sustained, think about the sustainer. Excellent. God is, you know, the sustainer and he'll open other doors for you, inshallah. Excellent. Another question, are skinny jeans allowed for women? Well, let's put, put it out there, are skinny jeans allowed for women and for men? Yeah, you know, it's difficult because you, they, they look so cool um, in some cases, uh, the skinny jeans. And I think that if a person is able to wear them in a, in a state of modesty as well. Someone will say, well, that's impossible because they can never be 
Well, you may have certain uh, women out there who may wear, for example, a longer shirt, and the only skinny part, therefore, is the, the shin area. I think Islam tries to talk about the fact that, you know, there are certain body parts um, where, where if the figure of that body part is showing or is clear, then that's not to be counted as the jilbab, for example. But if someone's wearing a loose, um, a loose shirt or a, a jacket or something, and under there is skinny jeans, then there is no issue there. But then ultimately, the highest libas, the highest form of clothing in Islam is libas taqwa. The clothing of taqwa. The clothing of being conscious of Allah's presence in your social and physical etiquettes. You can sit here all day and talk about skinny, baggy, loose, slim fit, skinny fit. We can sit and talk about all that all day. There are those who know that when I'm wearing this, this is going to bring about attraction and it could lead to immorality and there are others who are going to carry themselves in a way in which it won't so i think ultimately the person in their taqwa and their relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best person um to know what they are doing with such forms of clothing and the quran says you know man is the best mirror for themselves however many excuses they make yeah Sheikhna, sorry sayyidna are women allowed to wear niqab in prayer and doesn't this stop their forehead touching the turba? Yeah, so as we mentioned, when it comes to hajj or it comes to salah, the face is to be showing. Um, and these are parts of the laws um, for the acts of worship. Others may say, yeah, these are specific laws for the acts of worship. But when it comes to public interactions, it's a different context. Yeah. Sayyidina, I believe we have a caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum, my name is Ahmed from Sheffield. MashaAllah, Ahmed. Your question, please, for the Sayyid. Yeah, um, I wanted to know, uh, you know, before I get married, how should we, you know, discuss uh, the hijab, if we want to say hijab policy with our spouses, what we want them to wear, what we don't want them to wear? What do you mean, what, what you want them to wear and what you don't want them to wear? You're, you're not picking up a gun on someone's daughter and telling her that, listen, if you don't wear this, I'm going to kick you out of the house. This attitude that many people have when, they're, when they want to get married, that... I, as the guy, I'm going to tell the girl that this is exactly what I want you and what I don't want you to wear. Listen, you're not taking someone's, you know, some random girl from the street. You're taking someone's daughter who's been raised in a household, in many cases of respect and modesty. You build with each other spiritually. You grow with each other. Um, I, I do believe in the idea that if you, you, you have to be very clear from the beginning that if you intend to marry someone who is wearing the hijab, or you intend to marry someone who you want to wear the hijab. Make that clear from the beginning. Because there are some who say, well, in the beginning you didn't say anything. Now, why are you telling me to do this now? Even though they shouldn't really be too concerned about him. They should be more concerned mm -hmm. about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But anyway, uh, but this, this attitude that I want to tell her that this is what she should do. No. Either you marry someone who's already wearing the veil. And then both of you grow together. Or if you're going to marry someone who doesn't wear the veil. You want her to all of a sudden wear the veil? Then don't be impatient. When you married her, she wasn't wearing the veil. You may have taken a couple of steps spiritually one way. She may be taking a couple of steps spiritually in, a, in, a, in another way. Because there are many who don't wear hijab, but they are wonderful human beings. But talk in a way in which you build and grow together. There are some men out there who say, well, because my wife doesn't wear hijab, that's enough reason for me to leave her. No, build together. Get closer to Ahl al-Bayt. The ladies of Ahl al-Bayt set a wonderful example where when you wore the hijab, you were able to defeat the empires of your time. Um, you know, those magnanimous speeches of the Ahl al-Bayt in the face of tyrants like the tyrants of Sham. Um, those, are, those are messages for us that, you know what, don't think that when you take a step in wearing the veil, you may get people attacking you, so did Zainab. You may get people mocking you, so did Zainab. You may get people betraying you, so did Zainab. But ultimately, who remembers Zainab and who remembers Yazid today? Yeah. So you mentioned say, the Zainab. We've heard that the, the, the veils were pulled off the women in Karbala. Could you please enlighten us a little bit more on yeah, what actually a, happened? The, the women at Karbala were all covering their faces. So it was seen that the Ahd al-Bayt um, would wear the face veil. 
it's not obligatory for some in, in terms of their followers, but it was seen that they would wear the face veil. And um, these face veils were ripped off their faces. Um, and Sayyidah Zainab tells Yazid in, in the court in Sham, is it fair that you disgrace us by unveiling our faces so that all can see us from the stranger to the acquaintance, from the noble to the ignoble, while there is none to defend us. So, yeah, they, they had their face veil removed. People were able to stare at them and see them for the first time. Some people try and say that, you know, their, their hair was also showing because they see that, for example, in lines like the lines in Ziyarat al Nahi al Muqaddasa, when they read the lines Nashirat al Shu'ur, for example, some, you know, some will turn around and say that that is, you know, clear and obvious that their hair was now exposed. But you can let out your hair in front of those people who are related to you. It doesn't mean you're letting out your hair in front of uh, the opposition leaders. Or you let out your hair, but under your uh, veil as a sign of grief in contrast to the hair that's been placed in a particular bun, for example, which would be the sign of happiness uh, with the Arabs at the time. Yeah. So then a question from uh, WhatsApp. Salam, I want to ask a question. How do we differentiate between Qisma, also known as Taqdir, and predestination, specifically in terms of getting married? How do we know that this is Allah's will? If something bad happens or later on, is this Qisma? or Allah will or bad decision making? Inshallah, we have a discussion coming up on this in a couple of shows time. We're looking at predestination and free will and uh, within that discussion, we'll, we'll examine this. Yep. Sayyidina, when Europe is beginning to ban facial covering, what should Muslims in the West do? I mean, we've already seen France. Denmark have also uh, um, you know, joined the campaign. With this happening in, in London, is it a matter of time with there's some sort of international um, campaign to ban the burqa full stop? Yeah, well, as I said, being politically involved is, is fundamental. You know, having a say in a democratic society, I think is something which we all have to appreciate is a, is a plus. Um, while many of us may take the legal opinion that that is not something obligatory, but still it could be a domino effect. If you begin with the face veil, the next thing that could be removed could be uh, the head veil um, or the veil of the hair. So I think that Muslims must uh, sit up and take notice. But I also think that many non-Muslims, when they saw these wordings, were disgusted by this language. Let's not make it out like suddenly the whole country has supported a person who has said that, you know, ladies who cover their faces look like letterboxes or burglars. The majority of the people that we see in this country have been, ex you know, extremely supportive majority of the people that we see in this country have said that listen i'm not going to stop anyone wearing what they want to wear now that is a statement of truth um with certain um you know with certain i think with certain other aims you know sometimes someone says something truthfully that i don't mind what anyone wears everyone should be allowed to wear what they want that could also have other connotations but i think that they Sincerely mean that if that lady, and you know, sometimes the image is given that those ladies who wear the niqab are all uneducated, they come from villages, and that's why they wear the niqab. I think that, that while in some cases that's true, that there are certain ladies who, you know, make some in village in Afghanistan or in Pakistan or parts of um, Middle East where they were forced to cover their faces when they leave their houses, there are also many educated women who have decided that that for us is the highest level of taqwa, the highest level of uh, uh, modesty uh, possible. So let's not try and give this impression that everybody in Europe wants this type of language. There are many who are against this type of language. Um, and nor should we give this impression that those who do cover their faces are uneducated, illiterate women. On the contrary, there are people who have degrees from top universities who have decided that they that maybe the ayah that, you know, that Surah 24 verse 31, illa liba except to their husbands, that they only want to show their face, except to their husbands and to their family members. That's a decision they've taken on in life. But don't insult them by saying that these are uneducated women. You know, um, I know that there are some who are unfairly forced to have that facial um, uh, covering. But then there are some who live in this country who have decided that for them, this is the 
highest form of modesty. Yeah. Seva, any final point you want to give to uh, our audience? Uh, one question I didn't get a chance to ask you was, what about those who have good, clear intentions, uh, who, who may have a very, very strong relationship with the Ahlul Bayt and a strong relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but don't cover their hair? Surely, th- th- I mean, is not covering the hair, is, is that exclude them from such mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and such... Oh, don't worry about mercy. exclusion of mercy. God has given mer- is merciful to people... Um, much worse than that and the door of mercy and the door of forgiveness is always open for anyone nor should we keep entering this judgmental streak that has permeated the Muslim community where if we see someone who doesn't look religious by our barometer that means automatically those people um, we want to send them to hell we should be more concerned about figuring out how we're going to get to that heavenly abode Um, but as I said sometimes when you want someone to wear the the veil um, you're part of the growth, you're part of the problem, you're part of the solution. So it shouldn't just always be males who are dictating this is how it should be done. I think there are some brilliant role models who wear the veil. I think you know, they can be as inspiring as role models to these ladies. But don't please be judgmental or rude towards anyone who in their life isn't because you know those people we don't know what circumstances have led them to this all we can do is say that we have the greats of ahl al-bayt alayhim salam and we try and emulate them as much as we can excellent Asan. thank you very much thank you and a thank you to all our audience for joining us inshallah we'll be back next week on monday um until then assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah